In my last video, I asked the question, does Denlinger deny the Incarnation? What exactly happened in the Virgin's womb? Because I hadn't, at least to my knowledge, heard him make a clear statement regarding the Incarnation and some of those details. Well, I now have some information regarding his view, so we're going to cover a small clip because it is enlightening in a sense. He's reading a letter from a viewer, and in the first question, the viewer says, I heard many times pastors, preachers mentioning that Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. After understanding Godhead, I believe this is wrong teaching. And that particular verbiage is not the best, and uh, I'll play the short clip to help detail why that is. Well, I prefer truly God and truly man, truly and truly because man. it can be confused, and when you say that Jesus was fully God and fully man, if you mean by that, that that one person was absolutely, totally God and that's all, then you'd be denying his humanity. Or if you say he was fully man, then there's no room for his deity. That's why we like to say vera homo, vera deus, truly God, truly man. So truly God and truly man, or perfect God and perfect man would be better. Jesus was not 100% man when he was on earth 2,000 years ago. According to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus' blood is God the Father's blood, so it is sinless, unlike man's blood. Exactly. Also Romans 8, 3, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus' Jesus's flesh is not the same as man's flesh, which is sinful. Scripture says, in the likeness. Okay? So it's not, so it's not the same. Uh, so I don't buy the statement of 100% and 100% God anymore. He is definitely 100% God. Please correct me if I am wrong. No, you're not wrong. You're exactly correct. All right, so we've got Acts 20:28 20, and Romans 8, 3. We'll cover these two briefly. For Acts 20:28, 20, we must rule out this speaking of God as God or God the Father, since God's nature is spirit, from John 4, 24. And to have blood means you are physical, corporeal. Anything corporeal is made of matter, and matter is created by God. Therefore, God cannot have blood, since it is impossible for him to have creation as a necessary part of his being. Now, it is the incarnate Son who died on the cross, and the Son is God, yet he is also man, truly and really. This verse would be a scriptural occurrence of what has been referred to as the communicatio idiomatum, or communication of proper qualities, which is a term used in Christology to describe the way in which the properties, or idiomata, of each nature are communicated to or interchanged in the unity of the person. Now, there are different understandings and aspects of this which we won't get into, but in its most basic meaning, since Jesus Christ is one person in two natures, we can speak of him concretely in terms of or by the properties of the other nature. Hence, we can say God died, not God abstractly, since God cannot die, but he who is God and man died. We can say, this man Jesus is omnipresent, because, again, he is God and man. We can't say, man is omnipresent, or Jesus according to his manhood is omnipresent. We should also avoid making statements without doing the work to clarify the meaning. So if you do say, God died, you should, and should be able to, communicate what is meant by that, lest someone only hear, the eternal God who upholds the world died. So to recap, God does not have blood, therefore God cannot bleed. But the one who is God and man has blood, so we can correctly call him God, which he is, and say that he bled. Now for Romans 8.3, The Son did not come to us in the likeness of flesh, but the likeness of sinful flesh. The Son did not come in sinful flesh, but the likeness of sinful flesh. In other places in Scripture, Jesus is called man, and he is truly man, yet without sin. Now, I understand these explanations don't prove that Christ is one person in two natures, per se. Here, I only wanted to show that there is a reasonable explanation of the verses that are being used as arguments against the Orthodox Trinitarian understanding, and that explanation does justice to the text of Scripture. Whenever you see statements, Jesus is 100% man, fully God and fully man, you know, or they'll even use the H word there, Hugh man. Uh, not even understanding what that comes from. There's no word human in the Bible. Um, it's a modern politically correct term, so you don't offend a bunch of liberal devils. Uh, no, human is not the right word. It's mankind. All right, Denlinger is just wrong about the word human. The 1549 prayer book's version of the Athanasian Creed says, perfect God and perfect man of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting. Now, this was the first occurrence that came to my mind when I heard this. So I've spent 
no further time searching for the first occurrence of human in English. If you know or find when the word started being used, please let me know. 1549 seemed early enough to disprove this being a modern, politically correct term so you don't offend a bunch of liberal devils. Okay, but uh, Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Fully man, fully God. Chapter and verse, book, chapter and verse, excuse me. Um, book, chapter and verse, please. Where does it say 100% man, 100% God? It doesn't. Fully man, fully God, it doesn't. Okay, then reject it, which you've done, and you summed it up perfectly. Book, chapter, and verse. This one is actually very easy to show. The New Testament in numerous places shows Jesus to be God. Now, since God is simple and indivisible, it's impossible for one who is God to not possess all of the essence of God. But is Jesus Christ truly man, or is he merely a part of man? Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There are other scriptures we could give and further arguments we could make, but these verses clearly state that Jesus partook of our flesh and blood in taking on the nature of man. Um, he was not fully man. That's nonsense. He took on a body of flesh in the likeness of sinful flesh. It was flesh that felt pain and was corruptible in the sense of it would get older and it would you know, die, but it was not sinful flesh like what we have. That's why... When he was born, he was born of a virgin. So there's no, well, you know, she's already had multiple children. No, no. He had to be born of a virgin, and his father was not a man. So that the sinful blood did not come from a father. See? It seems like Denlinger holds that sin is part of man's essential nature. This is, of course, not the case, because man was created upright and subsequently fell. Therefore, if Jesus is truly man, it does not necessitate that he be sinful. Since sinful is not the natural condition or state of man as he was originally made. If Jesus is not truly man, then whatever he lacks of our nature is not atoned for, as Gregory of Nazianz has pointed out so long ago. For that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. The blood that came there that was in the body of Jesus Christ is God the Father. God is his Father, the soul of the Godhead. So you have it exactly correct. Finally, he says that the blood that came there, that was in the body of Jesus Christ, is God the Father. God is his Father, the soul of the Godhead. I'm going to take this as meaning that the blood is from the Father, not that it is the Father. And by his own admission, the Father is the soul, so the Father does not have blood. Further, back to Romans 8.3, it says God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. It does not say that he became the Son by coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, but that the Son is sent by the Father in the likeness, etc. The Son is eternally the Son, and the Father eternally the Father. A Son has the same nature as his Father. So since the Son is eternal, and the Father is eternal, and there is but one God, they share the same numeric nature. In Denlinger's system, the nature of soul is not body, and the nature of body is not soul. So the Father can't be the Father of the Son, and vice versa. There would be at least two different eternal things by nature, and thus his system is really polytheistic in that sense. <laughs>